It is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Mike Evans. Mike Evans is the founder and executive director of Full Court Peace, a nonprofit organization dedicated to united disparate communities through basketball. Evans, a native of Weston, Connecticut, was an all-state high school basketball player before going to play Division III basketball at Hamilton College. At Hamilton, Evans set two three-point shooting records that are still in act today, propelling him to two years of semi-professional basketball in Belfast, Northern Ireland. While in Belfast, Evans coached basketball at an all-Catholic high school where he learned his players' disdain and hatred for their Protestant neighbors. Without telling his uh, Catholic players, Mike began coaching at an all-Protestant high school, and eventually, with the blessing of area paramilitary groups, united the boys to form one team. Mike pioneered a similar program in Havana, Cuba, and has since expanded to Juarez, Mexico, Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic, Wind River Indian Reservation in Wyoming, and to the poverty-stricken neighborhoods of Connecticut cities where the income and achievement gaps are their highest nationally. Evans has a master's in education from the Harvard Kennedy School and the Graduate School of Education. He teaches Spanish and coaches varsity basketball in Connecticut. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a privilege to present to you Mike Evans. Thank you, Griffin. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming today and for having such an interest in my story and the work that I do. Um, <clears throat> My, my grandfather was a marine officer and my, my dad was a naval officer and my dad actually thought that you guys would all start booing when I said that, so I'm, I'm relieved that you're not doing that. Um, but I used to be impressed by their bravery until I started teaching middle school and, and I really understood that I was actually the bravest of, of the lineage. Um, I, I want to start you know, really simply by saying how much I, I'm honored to be here. Um, I look at the military with such awe and admiration and I always have. It's not lost on me that I get to live the life that I live because of the things that you guys do. Uh, and and that's, that's been instilled in me since I was a kid by my father and my grandfather, but now being here today is, is the biggest honor of, um, of my career. Uh, I've been fortunate to establish myself um, in a growing field of what's called sports diplomacy, using, in my case, basketball to enter into communities where I otherwise might not be welcome and make change in those communities. Um, I, uh, for the past 15 years now, uh, I've been uh, worked in the context of uh, religious war, serious government oppression, um, places that are overcome by violence, uh, basically out of control, uh, third world poverty, and what is modern day racial segregation in a place like Connecticut, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, in all of these contexts, I failed and failed and failed until eventually I found success, of course not on my own, but with the help of local people. And success in my case looks like building something that I call organic unity, which is when the local people who are living in these, in these very tough environments take control of what Full Court Peace and, and, and I have started and take it in their own direction um, with their own free will and without the help of outsiders. Uh, today I'll talk about three lessons that I've learned. Um, and you know, when I was asked to speak here, I thought, well, I've never really narrowed it down to three. I wonder if I can narrow it down to three. But these are three lessons I've learned in these different contexts, mostly through failure and mostly through the help of, of local people. Um, intermingled in these uh, three lessons are stories of a little bit of my background, but also uh, bravery and acts of, um, you know, some, some scary stuff that happened to kids along the way and adults along the way, putting themselves in positions to make change in their communities that b before they had never um, envisioned. Um, finally, I, I, I look forward to the question and answer period where you tell me what you're thinking of doing or what you're currently doing and how I might be able to talk to you about stuff that I've done and I'm sure I can learn as much from you as you can from me. Um, so, it started with, this is my, my mother and father here, um, believe it or not, my parents are married, have been married for 40 years, and they think about as oppositely as, as these two people do. Uh, so every other November, especially every four Novembers, you really can't sit down to dinner with them, but otherwise, thanks to uh, Catholicism and probably vodka, they, they're still married. Um, but, uh, you know, the advantage here of growing up in a home where people thought very differently, and during a time when one guy delivered the news, there was one guy telling us what happened that day. He didn't, in, in, he didn't put his opinion into the report like we see on both sides of the aisle today. One guy said, here's what's happening in the world in a short, fixed amount of time. The TV got shut off and then my mom and dad would start to talk. And I didn't know what they were talking about and all I could do was sit there and listen and watch my dad yell and scream at my mom kind of 
you know, cower, but then come up with their own solid points. And that happened a lot. And it was, it was a huge advantage to be around them because it, it really instilled in my mind that was, there was not one side, everything there were actually two. And, and of course, I learned later that there were more. When I became a teenager, I started listening to my parents' stories and understanding how they ended up where they were. So my dad grew up in the 40s in Chicago with two working parents in a working class neighborhood and was told, you can get out of this situation by pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. My mom grew up in the 40s in Seattle. Her father had left the home when she was five. And so her sister and her had to survive off of social welfare programs because their mother did not have a driver's license and was a recent immigrant from Scotland. So my mom grew up with her mindset shaped that government programs could help people get by. So I got to hear all these stories over and over again. And as I grew up, they really instilled in me an idea that there were two sides to everything. I started falling in love with basketball, mostly because my dad played baseball and football growing up. And my brother, my, so I, in case you're wondering if I'm an Irish American, I, I, have, I have substantial proof for you. My brother was born in January of 1982. And I was born in December of 1982. So you can <laughs> stop, you can, you can do all the math you want. I've had every awkward conversation you could imagine about this, explaining it to people. So, th so we're Irish twins. My brother played baseball and football to, to sort of gravitate towards my dad. And I wanted to, s to step away and play something else that was different from, from them. And so I played basketball. And my parents actually agreed that in order for me to be more well-rounded and, and be better at basketball that I should play in this city called Bridgeport, which was only a 20-minute drive from the homogenous community I grew up in, in called Weston, Connecticut. And so 20 minutes up the road, my dad would take me twice a week to play basketball. And I was on a basketball team. And my brother and I, at this point, were playing one-on-one -on -one in the driveway, which every s n we did not finish one game in 20 years of playing one-on-one. -on -one. Not one game actually finished. It was always a fist fight. And in Connecticut, a fist fight's more like slapping and running away. But um, I had to develop a jump shot because I was so terrified of driving to the basket on my brother because he would just foul me so hard. So I went up to Bridgeport to play. These kids played up and down and drove to the basket every time. And I found a role on my team as a shooting guard. And the players on the team valued that skill in me so much. It built up so much of my confidence. I built an identity, identity around being a shooter. But when I went back to Weston, I felt so unique that I, know, I knew these kids that looked nothing like me. Some of them spoke with accents because their parents were immigrants, and they were, they were immigrants. And other kids came from really poor backgrounds, and I was this kid from the suburbs playing on their team, and I was becoming a shooter. So I felt valued, and it was the first time basketball had helped me penetrate a community that I otherwise would not have ever been able to get in, and it was an absolute rush. So I played high school basketball, and I was an all-state player, but in Connecticut, that's like being all county in Texas or something, so it's really not, not a big deal. And then I played Division three basketball in college, and that's where you, you don't get a scholarship. You actually pay way more to play basketball in college, so keep it in perspective here. But um, I fell in love with my coach. I loved my teammates. I played with guys from all around the world, and it was second eight. I had already had that experience as a young person, and, and so I loved, I loved every moment of being on a team in college, and I could not give it up. All my friends in college went on to sales jobs and stuff like that, and I was fortunate um, to move to a place where slow, six so tall white guys play professional basketball, and it's actually called Ireland. Um, for those of you who don't know, the, the, in 1922, partition happened in Ireland, and that was when the Irish Republican Army had successfully fought off the Brits to get what you see in green here, the 26 counties in the south. And the six counties in the north were going to remain under British rule, and that's how we have Northern Ireland and Ireland today, Dublin being the capital of Ireland and Belfast being the capital of Northern Ireland. When I played in Northern Ireland, it was the lowest ranked league in Europe. So I, I was playing at a very low level. But I realized two things when I got to Belfast. One, my teammates smoked cigarettes at halftime, and they brought beers with them in their bags for the after the game, win or lose. So they were just sort of having a laugh, and I was the guy that was taking it way too seriously. Two, Belfast was still really segregated. So 1968 to 1999, you have a thing that's called the Troubles, where Protestants who consider themselves to be British citizens and Catholics who consider themselves to be Irish citizens in places like Belfast are fighting a modern day terrorist war to rid the Brits out of Ireland. The Protestants are trying to keep control. Really ugly. Over the course of about those 30 years, 3,500 people died in the street in front of relatives and stuff like that. Very ugly war. Um, 
segregation looks like this there. This is, this is still there, by the way, 2020. So this is a wall that keeps Catholic and Protestant people apart. And there are 75 in Northern Ireland and there are 25 in Belfast. And there's one being built today. 98% of the schools are segregated on Protestant and Catholic lines. Bars, supermarkets, gyms, all segregated. No intermingling. Where there's wealth and, and um, opportunity, people get along better. But where there's poverty, there are these walls to keep people apart. I started coaching basketball to make some extra money at an all-Catholic school that is on the left at the end of this blue little um, map, this uh, road here. And I was making some money and listening to these kids after and during basketball telling me how much they hated the kids over on the right, a nine-minute drive away, even shorter than Weston to Bridgeport. And so I'm just, just like when my parents were debating and, and I decided to sit there and listen and the kids were telling me what the Protestants had done, this and that. So I'd pick up a book at a library and read the book and try to understand it better. Then I went to the Protestant school, but I didn't tell the Catholics. And I started coaching in the Protestant school and they started having their side of the story. So I picked up a couple books and I'd read that. I started to try to become an expert and I was building a network of people that I could talk to in Belfast, always over a pint of Guinness, of course about what had happened over those 30 years. Why, how, how had this ended up this way? And what do these 15 year old boys at these high schools where I'm coaching need in order to make the right decision and live in a more unified Belfast? This is the situation we're talking about. These kids that I was coaching, they lived next door to one another. This is a, a wall erected to keep people apart. So literal neighbors, before the late 60s and early 70s when the walls were built, being separated by these walls. And these kids lived in these, in these communities. Now, basketball was the only sport in Northern Ireland not claimed by one of the religions. So cricket and rugby are played by Protestants. Those are English sports. Gaelic football and hurling are played by Catholics. Those are Irish sports. Soccer, everybody plays. But it's so contentious because the professional teams, if they set up their stadium in a Catholic neighborhood, for example, all the players could be from China, then they could all be atheists. So same with the owners and the managers and the coach. But because the stadium is in a Catholic neighborhood, it becomes a Catholic team. And the uniform that you can buy in the store becomes a tribal symbol and not just, I'm a fan of this team. Basketball, everybody was terrible at. So no one claimed it as their own. And for a country where it rains 300 days a year, they're really bad at indoor sports, which I always found to be fascinating. Um, so I'm coaching these kids on different sides of the wall. I'm really getting to know them. About five of them on each side of the wall e in each school decide they want to play more competitively. They, we started an after-school program. Previously, I had just been coaching in, um, in PE classes. And all I could do was coach them. I couldn't bring up these things. I wasn't an expert. I didn't know much about the conflict. I was reading a lot, but I just had to be a listener. Again, just like I was with my parents. Eventually, I get to the point where I want to try to bring these two groups of boys together. And so I go to the principals at each school, and they were both, both women. They both were very progressive-minded and thought the idea was great. And they said, look, you can do it, and, and we, we can facilitate it, but it's not going to be easy. And so inevitably, I had to have a conversation with each group of boys about what my idea was, which was I was really dreading. So I, in, in each, each scenario looked about exactly the same. I went to the boys were after basketball one day and I said, hey, I, I think we should start a travel basketball team. I said, oh, right, coach, we'd love to do that. I would do the accent, but I'm really bad at it. You know, right, coach, I'd love to play on a travel team. That'd be great. You know, I say, oh, we'll get some uniforms. We'll, we'll play teams around Belfast. I had some connections to some other coaches. And then inevitably they said, well, we only have five guys, five lads. We only have five lads. How can we, how can we form a team? I said, oh, well, you know, I got these other guys. These other five guys on the other side. And they looked at me like I had three heads. And a couple of them used the word betrayal. A couple of them said, I can't believe you've been working with them. And I really thought I had totally failed. It was a very scary moment. I thought I'd, you know, I had this project moving in such great, with such great momentum and now it came to a complete stop. Throughout my networking, I had climbed my way to the top of the Irish Republican Army for private interviews with a man named Eddie Copeland. Eddie Copeland was the head of the IRA in Belfast and one of the most wanted men in all of Europe. I called him after getting his phone number and he said in a quiet voice, call me, in 24, call me 24 hours from now to the minute and he hung up on me. And so for 24 hours, inevitably, I was watched by the IRA to make sure I wasn't somebody that was gonna hurt Eddie Copeland. 
To the minute, I called him 24 hours later, and he said, come up to my neighborhood. So I called up my best friend, Patty. A Protestant could not drive me up there, and you can know if someone's Protestant or Catholic just by their first name in Northern Ireland. Patty drove me up, dropped me off. He said, good luck. As soon as I got to the neighborhood, my phone rang. So someone was watching me. Pick up the phone. The voice says, don't move. Stay right where you are. Car pulls up. Black Volkswagen, tinted windows. Window rolls down about an inch. Are you Mike? Yes. Hop in the car. So, opens the door, hop in the car. I look directly forward, I do not look at the driver, and the car starts moving. As soon as the driver started to talk, I looked down at his pant leg, and he was shifting gears in the clutch, and his pant leg came up, and I could see a prosthetic. And then one thing you could learn about Eddie Copeland was that he had put his car in reverse in the 80s in front of his house when he was really in the thick of the violence, and a rival Protestant paramilitary group had planted a car bomb in his car and it only blew up partially and blew off part of his leg. And as soon as I saw the prosthetic, I heard, how'd you get my number? And I was in the car with Eddie Copeland. And so he drove around for about an hour as he was vetting me, telling me about his battles with the FBI and this and this and nothing that I, of course, could relate to. And Eddie had agreed to meet with me under the idea that I was just writing a book about Belfast. I told him nothing about the work that I was doing. We went to a deli and everyone was staring at me wondering who the heck this kid was hanging out with Eddie Copeland. We started talking, he started warming up to me and I finally said, Eddie, look, I need your help. I'm coaching a basketball team that I want to come together and they're from this neighborhood and this neighborhood. And they, they, the kids have refused to play basketball together and he said, Mike, he looked at me for a second and he said, Mike, you know, what you're doing is exactly what Belfast needs. We need to move forward. This is a guy in a position of power that segregates people on purpose, grows violence and he's telling me, these kids do need to come together. He said, but basketball might bond them like you're telling them, but it's a, it, you need to give them an opportunity. These kids come from nothing. Give them an opportunity to do something they've never done before. And so on my mom's dime, I flew back to Connecticut. My dad at this point was like, get a real job. You know, my mom, rainbows and butterflies on the left. My dad, get a real job on the right. You know. Flew home to Weston, where I grew up, spoke at a Protestant and Catholic church and they were right next door to each other. I explained to the congregations, I said, if we were in Belfast, we'd have a wall between our two churches. And I've got these kids, and I really want to bring them to Weston this coming summer to play as a team. But I need, I need your help. And that day, I had the host families and the money to do it. So again, on my mom's dime, I flew back to Belfast, and I went to the social leaders of each of the groups of boys, and I said, look, I know you think I betrayed you, but I have an opportunity for you. If you play on this team, I'll bring you to Connecticut. They, of course, thought I meant Canada. I said, no, it's Connecticut. It's this tiny little state by New York. I said, you get to stay in people's houses, and they have Mercedes and pools and all this kind of stuff. And the guys kind of looked at me, and they went back to their groups, and I got text messages later that confirming, yes, we'll play on the team. We'll do it. We'll try it out. And so the Protestant school hosted the first practice. The Catholics had to come to the school. They had to come around the back, and they couldn't wear their school uniforms because they were visually Catholic. You can tell if a kid is Catholic or Protestant by his school uniform from 100 yards away. They came into the gym. They started shooting around. The Protestants got out of school. They came into the gym. Dead silence. Protestants would not cross the half-court line to meet the Catholics and vice versa. So the first team meeting was me, a group of boys, and a group of boys like that. Aw most awkward thing I've ever done. About two weeks of practice, there was no speaking, until eventually I saw nods. Good pass, good shot, just with a nod. And I'm, I, I'll never forget how excited I got with the first fist bump across Protestant and Catholic lines. The smallest little thing started to happen. And then a little bit of a huddle. Boys are awkward, one arm around another, Protestant Catholic. I knew exactly what was happening. And then names being called three weeks in. Good pass, Liam. Nice shot, Robert. Again, names you know, Protestant or Catholic. So eventually I set up a game for them against an all-Catholic school in a wealthy part of Belfast. And I had to escort the Protestants into the gym to meet their Catholic teammates. And I could see the relief in the Protestants when they saw someone they knew at the gym. And these were Protestants coming into a Catholic neighborhood. And I had to, had to escort them in. And the Catholic team we were playing, they had matching uniforms and matching sneakers. And their parents were in the crowd. They had already emailed the coach to say, if you don't play my son enough, I'm going to fire you. That, sorry, that's Connecticut. That's what I deal with. Sorry. Um, and suddenly it became city street kids, kids from the street with tattooed wrists. These are all my kids. Working class versus the kids who had a lot. Suddenly the Protestant Catholic thing was gone. And so I started two Catholics and three Protestants. 
One of the Catholics took the jump ball, the ref threw it up in the air, and as soon as the ball went up, I realized I had spent not enough time talking about the rules of basketball. <laughs> so the other Catholic kid on the other team jumps up to get it, and what does the kid on my team do? He shoves him down to the ground, and the kid falls down, and he catches the ball, and he starts tripling. The ref, the parents are aghast. They can't believe what's happening. None of the parents on my team ever came to one game. Not because they were against it. I can talk about that later. But the ref looks at me like, what's going on? But I saw the Protestants look at the Catholic and nod. And there was just something that just started. And believe it or not, the Catholics on the other team were terrified. And we won our first game. We were 1-0. I couldn't believe it. So at the end of the game, we decided our team name would be the Belfast Blazers. They decided right there and then. We played about five or six games in our season uh, over the next six to eight weeks. And the boys really started to come together. And every single game, there was an opportunity for them to bond over who they were playing. We tried to play private schools because they had more opportunity and it would bond our kids to play together. It was a fascinating thing to watch. Um, the first lesson I learned from the Belfast Blazers was simple. And I call it the common ground faucet. In these places where there are conflicts, whether it's in my house with my parents, when I went up to Bridgeport to play basketball, or with the Protestants and Catholics in Belfast. There's way more common ground than you think. There's way more common ground. There are politicians and media who get paid to separate us. And there's always more people who agree than people who disagree. So the faucet is sometimes hard to turn on. Sometimes the switch is broken. Sometimes you've created a new switch. Sometimes it's rusty. Once you get it turned on, you can't turn it off. When I left Belfast, a couple of the kids started their own teams with even younger kids in their community, which was risky for them. But it was something that happened to them. They had this opportunity. And by the way, they lost every game they played in Connecticut by 60 points, which they thought was hilarious. And one of the host families bought them matching uniforms. It was lovely. But anyway, lesson one, the common ground faucet. I guess I got sick of the dark weather, um, and I wanted some more sunlight. So in 2009, I went down to Havana, Cuba, looking for an opportunity to use basketball to bring Cubans and Americans together. 2009 was a tough year for our two countries. In 2009, a guy named Alan Gross was a contractor for USAID. He brought uh, modems and laptops in his, uh, modems, laptops, and routers in his suitcase through uh, sec security at customs. And the Cubans didn't say anything. The Cubans are known for letting you come in and break a law so they can keep you instead of stopping you from entering. And he told the Cuban government that he was there to help you know, grow Wi-Fi in, in, in regular above-board communities, when in reality, he was setting up Wi-Fi signals for dissidents and bloggers who were speaking out against the Cuban government. He was taken prisoner in 2009, lost 100 pounds in jail. Um, uh, three people were denied access to him. Uh, Jimmy Carter was told he couldn't even see uh, Alan Gross on a visit. Bill Richardson, former governor of New Mexico, who got contractors out of Afghanistan and North Korea, was told no, and the Pope. It was a very serious situation. So 2009, I went down to Cuba to play pick a basketball for two weeks, just to see what the situation was. And I found courts and hoops and shambles, but I saw a lot of passion in basketball. Now, we know Cubans play baseball. They play volleyball. Those sports are heavily guarded by the regime. You can't just come in and start playing baseball with Cubans. But basketball is a street sport. There's a professional league there, but they make as much money as the average Cuban, which is $20 a month. That's what professional basketball players make. Um, so I told the Cubans, all right, I'm going to come back in a year, and we're going to fix up these courts. And they were like, OK, sure, cool idea. And I got back to the US, and I was subpoenaed by the US government within a week of travel for what I was doing in Cuba, which was top five most terrifying moments of my life. But I started networking with people in Washington, DC about you know, what can I do in Cuba that's going to make a difference. And I'd only been there once, and these people had been there 40 or 50 times. And so I started listening and taking in ideas about teaching entrepreneurship, teach English and engage them in US-Cuba relations, connect them to Miami Cubans so they can grow their networks and, and overthrow their government. Wow, that's, that's really a tall order. Um, and I went back a year later with these ideas, and I met this guy. That's, that's me on the right before I started teaching middle schoolers. I looked, I had good complexion, and I looked young and felt young. Okay? This guy on the left, his name is Lazaro Delgado. At least as far as I know, that is his name. Lazaro came to me on my second trip. I had a bunch of um, men with me who had played college basketball, including a seven-footer. Came up to me in a hotel, and he said, how are you getting these people around? 
how are you fitting in the cars? And I said, well, it's been really hard. And he said, well, I have a coach bus. Why don't you let me drive you around? I'll be your driver. And so I went outside, I'm speaking to him in Spanish, and he shows me the coach bus, and he says, just pay me whatever you were paying the taxis. And 25-year-old Mike didn't think that that was a bit odd. And so for three years, Lazaro Delgado was our driver. He was never late, he never got pulled over, and we started painting basketball courts with these groups of people that would come with me. He knew where to get paint for half price, and he would get out of the bus to help us cement the courts, if need be. And he knew everybody everywhere we went. And then three years later, at the end of the third trip, when I was still trying to form an idea and networking with people about these complex, multi-layered ideas of what we could do in Cuba, Lazaro and I were at the airport by ourselves. And he handed me a flash drive. And he said, I've met so many of your friends over the years, and you know nothing about me. And I just thought I'd put some pictures of my daughters and my wife on this flash drive so you could know more about me. And for the first time ever, he hugged me, and he got on the bus and he drove away. I went through customs, I got onto my plane, and I popped the flash drive into my computer, and there were five pictures of Lazaro with Fidel Castro. I never saw Lazaro Delgado again. Lazaro Delgado was sent to me by the Cuban government because my program, whatever it was back then, it didn't re hadn't really taken shape. We had some big tournaments when we would bring players down. Lazaro was sent to me by the Cubans to figure out what I was doing. Go send that guy a bus driver. I have a white guy with a military haircut who speaks fluent Cuban Spanish. This can't be right. And so for three years, Lazaro followed me around. I never saw him again. I never saw him again. But at that moment, it was a very terrifying moment, especially going back the next year, not knowing what it meant that someone had followed me. When I was going through customs, was I about to join Alan Gross in prison? And I had a group of people with me. And I got into Cuba, I remember getting in quicker than I ever had. And I knew that Lazaro had probably reported to his higher ups that I was innocuous, that I was just there to grow basketball. And I knew from Lazaro's warning that his flash drive, his giving the flash drive to me was a message, which was be really careful here. And I took it as keep things really basic. And so we started listening to the locals. We started just painting as many courses as we could. Nothing, not teaching entrepreneurship, not teaching English, nothing that's gonna, it, it, that's gonna impact the regime's mentality about who I, who I am. I had to be who I said I was. We started getting, collecting light, lightly used sneakers from Connecticut, which kids grow out of sneakers and they give me these $200 pairs of sneakers and I bring them down to Cuba and giving them to young men who wanted to play basketball who were playing in sandals. And the Cubans said finally after four or five years, they said we want to start a league. So we got them uniforms and we started paying referees. And we, it was locally led. And the, the, the best lesson I learned here was how, how simple you need to be when you go into these environments. I could sit there and try to teach new norms to people who weren't used to those things. I could try to teach them new ideas, but I was an outsider. I was, on the, I was, on, I was a Protestant or a Catholic in this case. I was part of the conflict. So I couldn't come in and be complex. Thank, thanks to Lazaro, I, I, I figured that out quickly, that we had a shared bond and love for basketball. We got them basketballs, sneakers, and they started a league. If you try to be too complex in these scenarios, you're gonna look like you don't know what you're doing because it's gonna make your job much, much harder. Last lesson has to do with my most current project, which affects everybody in this room, if you, if you live in the United States. Um, in Connecticut, we ha like I said, we have, the biggest achieve we have the biggest economic gap between neighbors in the United States. There are probably areas that you might think rival that, but statistically, Fairfield County, Connecticut, which is a lot of hedge fund money from New York City, um, is the highest economic gap, the highest achievement gap between neighboring students, and the highest opportunity gap between neighbors. Literal neighbors, take Bridgeport for example. Bridgeport, Connecticut has 20% of people living below the poverty line. The national average is 13%. Not nearby, but direct neighbors, Fairfield, Connecticut. Now, I'm not here to talk about why that is or how to change that. That's not in my interest. What this causes is distrust among communities. These are people that share supermarkets and, don't, and walk past each other and never even speak to one another. And I'm here today because I don't believe that that's right. And I believe that kids should be taught that you don't have to figure out these problems, but it, it does matter that you respect one another. One example of distrust being built is that there's, there's a, a part of Bridgeport that is still technically Bridgeport, but it's right next to Fairfield. And people who live there say, say, where do you live? They say, I live in Black Rock. 
Oh, I say, oh, Bridgeport. And they say, no, it's, it's BlackRock. But if I send them a letter in the mail, I write Bridgeport on the envelope. And everyone here can probably think of their hometown or somewhere nearby where that is the case. And when Bridgeport people hear that, and it's very well known, and there's other examples in cities in Connecticut where people say, I live in this section. They don't say they live in that city. The, the, native, the people who live in that city hear you trying to live there but not admit you're living there. And the people that don't live in that city live in what's called the dominant community, hear it and think, just keep hearing that over and over, that there are sections where you can sort of pretend you don't live there. And that kids start hearing that vocabulary, and it builds distrust and questions among communities. So in, in 2013, I started a camp called Full Court Peace Camp that put white and black and Hispanic kids on a basketball team for one week together at a basketball camp. And there were no individual drills allowed. Every single day, every drill had to do with being on a team. Day one, learn how to huddle. Day one, they're, they're physically touching each other. Um, day two, if, a guy, if your teammate goes down, all four guys have to go pick him up. And so the kids are practicing these things over and over. Day three, and I hate this one, pick a dance that you do on the court when there's an and one play. And they all do this, you know, it's hilarious because they all love rap music, but whatever makes them bond is going to work. I just hate when people celebrate in sports. Um, but then I had to be honest with myself. I mean, why do the Protestants and Catholics get along? It was because of long-term interaction. It was sincere engagement. It was three practices a week in a game. It was traveling to another country together that, that forced that bond. This is one week out of the year. Look great on brochures. The suburban kids' parents loved it. They were happy to donate. But it wasn't really making a difference. And so the suburban kids thought, well, they come to our community and play in our gyms. What can we do for them? And so they started popping up high school clubs where they'd raise tons of money to then go into their camp teammates' communities and provide very basic things, including new hoops, simple, changes the, changes the neighborhood when you put a new hoop up and a new fresh coat of paint. Started travel basketball teams where kids didn't have sneakers, so we just bought them sneakers. We're not inventing the idea. They wanted a travel team. They knew how to run it. They knew how to put it together. They didn't have the resources. So the suburban kids stepped up and made it happen. Putting up new courts in blighted communities. Give people places to play. It's sig significant because now the suburban kids are coming in when the courts are opened and playing with the kids from camp and getting to know their neighborhood. So lesson three is loyalty is a currency accepted all around the world. If you keep showing up, you keep doing the right thing, you say who, you, you be who you say you are, you can overcome any type of segregation or separation among people. I'm here today because in Belfast, in Cuba, and you know, now I have a new project on, a, on, on an Indian reservation in Wyoming, where I, again, I have, I've had to come into a community where I'm immediately, this, people are wondering if they can trust me. All of these lessons in any context, I think, apply. Keep things really simple. Be who you say you're going to be, and there's way more common ground than you'd think. No matter what any news source says, you can find people who want to get along. Thank you very much. Mr. Evans, thank you so much for your message today. At this time, I would like to open the floor for questions. I will announce last question as we approach the end of the session. Copeland, C-O-P-E-L-A-N-D. He's considered the, um, the godfather by the British Parliament, refers to him as, he's never been arrested. So you can imagine. Um, stay simple. Lesson two is stay simple. Keep things very, very simple. Keep them, re them resource-based. If you can get resources to people who don't have resources, you're going to build a really strong bond. I've only been once. So I went once, and uh, I went. Uh, I was doing something with. Forgive me. Forgive me. Last summer, I did something with the Marine Corps, and I, I met. Um, I met somebody there who lived in Riverton. Riverton is a city that borders the Wind River Reservation. Um, they're on disputed land, so he said they won't. This is fascinating to me. The natives, uh, the Indians, they they call themselves um, Indians. So said that they would take help from someone from Connecticut over a neighbor 
because I'm not on disputed land. So he set me up with somebody who um, is not, not a native, lives in Riverton, but does the play-by-play -play for the high school games. So they have, the boys have, not, have won nine state championships on the reservation. Their high school gym seats 5,000 people. Uh, the girls have won six state championships, but they have no outdoor courts. There's 26 courts and all the hoops are leaned over. So the first visit was, ver was the meeting with the elders was relatively tense. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting there saying that I'm going to come through and they've heard that over and over and over again from oil companies and the government. Um, so I, I think it's going well so far. The first thing I did, knowing that I couldn't, um, I couldn't travel out to Wyoming and fix courts when it was snowing, was why don't I just start shipping sneakers out there? Getting early victories with the natives, start shipping them sneakers, because it said no one had sneakers. So, so far, so good. And the model with Cuba is that we've, you know, I've brought 900 Americans to Cuba in the last 12 years. And the model for Wind, Wind River is the same, that there are a lot of people in Connecticut from means who want to help. So we create these mission trip models that the finan finances work like everybody pays a price to go, and then the leftover money after the trip expenses go to the local communities to do whatever they want to do. So that we have our first trip in July to do that on Wind River. Sure. So uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut, we just started the first ever girls travel basketball team on the west side of Bridgeport. And that was just pairing up two affluent high school girl programs who wanted to help. And they raised the money and went over and, and helped them start the team. So that's our first ever travel team was a girls team. We did a women's ambassador trip to Cuba in 2013 with the WNBA player and a bunch of other women, uh, female college basketball players. Um, the machismo of Latin America is very apparent with outdoor sports. There isn't a, a pickup basketball culture in Santo Domingo or in Cuba. So uh, we have a trip, in our next trip in August with uh, young women coming. And that you really, there are so many women who want to play in those islands. Um, but you have to go get them to come out because the men just, they hog the courts. I know no one's surprised at that information. But uh, if that answers your question, in Connecticut, we're, we're doing a lot more with girls. It's easier, the girls play, and, and we, we believe in that. Um, in the Latin America, it's, 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 they're 50 years behind. It's, they don't, you know, so. Last question. Last question. Sure. Sure. Um, there was a day at, I played Division Three at Hamilton College for a guy who won 600 games. He was, he's in, in the Hall of Fame. And we were, we were really good. We went to two, two NCAA tournaments and one Sweet 16. So we had the most All-Americans in the history of Division Three college basketball. And one day we were, it was winter break and we were bickering a lot, not getting along as a team. And we were, but we were from a bunch of different backgrounds, you know. Um, and at the end of the practice, he was a man of very few words. He didn't talk a lot. He just won a lot of games and told us to work hard. And he was a good recruiter. We were all good high school players. And he sat us down on the baseline, and <laughs> he said, you guys aren't very good. If you were really good, you wouldn't be playing Division Three basketball. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody just deflated down to the same level. Because if you know Division Three athletes, they, you know, they could have gone D1 if it weren't for this, right? Sure, of course, right? Like growing six more inches, you know? Um, so I think that has, I've, I've said that to teams. You know, I'm a high school basketball coach back in Connecticut, and the lesson there is like, guys, you're all in the same place. You're not supposed to be anywhere else. You know, you're all in the same place. You're all trying to achieve one goal together, and bickering is not going to get you there. It's not getting along is the, is the recipe for losing. So that helps. Thank you guys, appreciate it. Mr. Evans, thank you again for your time today. On behalf of the 2020 NCLS participants, the cadet wing, and the faculty and staff of the Air Force Academy, we would like to present you with a small token of our appreciation. <laughs>